My mother's interest in uh, in books and history and uh, doing the two books on Covington led me into bookbinding. Yeah. And I probably, in a sense, I have to go way back to the fifth grade and give my teacher in the fifth grade credit for my having did the two history books in Covington. I, I was a real slow learner and kind of a screwball in, in, in school and uh, hellion. And, uh, one time we had a class on Thomas Edison and, uh, in the fifth grade, and Thomas Edison, uh, I sort of read it over, was a lot like myself. And <clears throat> one time when the bill collector came to collect some money from Thomas Edison, he hid in his cabins in his studio or his shop. He, he crawled into one of the cabinets underneath, and they came in and they looked the shop all over and figured that he fled and they couldn't collect any bill from him. And I thought, I said, that, that's me all over. And so, <laughs> At the end of the class, the teacher gave us a examination, and I got a hundred in it. And she said, "My God, you ought to be a historian." She said, uh, "The way you went through this class, because I got zero in everything else." And that probably really had a tremendous effect on my life. That one sentence of that teacher saying, "You know, you ought to be a historian," and uh, it was the one word I needed of encouragement in my life right at that moment. I knew the woman that was a bookbinder here in Northampton. Uh, she's done very fine work, and I also knew from my research of town records and church records that there was a tremendous need for doing restoration conservation work on town records and church records. He took me on as an apprentice, and uh, here I am today. I, the the night, day I approached her, I said, what I'd like to do is to have a shop downtown and and bind books in a window somewhere where the public could be aware of what's going on. I can remember in the 1930 coming down in old Mr. Stark's used to be over in Gare's jewelry shop and they, his repair shop was in the window and you used to walk on the sidewalk and you'd watch old Mr. Gare repairing watches all day long. You could, he'd be in there repairing clocks and watches. And uh, so I visualized that it being the same with books and here it is 10 years later. It's uh, in the window repairing <laughs> Pretty unique, the valley, when you start thinking about it. I mean, we're here it's and we just very go, unique. we go, hey, this is cool. We got bookstores, binders, writers, oh, printers. We don't even think about it. I did four books and two of them are designed by the two of the well, nationally known uh, book designers. I wanted to do the books. I happened to be in the book world because we had eight or ten bookbinder here in Northampton. I was apprenticing under some of them, and uh, some of them were book designer and so on. And so I'm very, very fortunate that I did four books for Cummington, three on Cummington and one uh, that went national, or went international really. And uh, I learned that we can, we, we, we farm boys can put out a nice book. We, we, we can put out a top notch book. Yeah, just like any other business, the, the proprietor don't do everything. The proprietor hire a technician in to do this and a chemist in to do that. And it's the same with the book. The only thing we got to know as the writer and the person doing the book is what makes a quality book. And once you know that, then you're all set. I think you put your finger on it a little bit there that helps define why the Connecticut Valley is the way it is, is you had a valley full of people that wanted to do things yeah. their yeah. own way yeah. and yeah. were satisfied only if it was done their own way. They were tinkerers, they were Yankees, they were, uh, were willing to go the extra step to make it more of a craftly, crafty craftsmanship product than just some industrial product that you might run into in the larger cities where it's just like hey we got well, let's, let's crank these out we have factories this area being unique in that it's kind of isolated it's not new york city it's boston but a lot of people from new york or boston came here to get away from the mentality that was there and it really created a whole different space i mean I, i've been all over the country I traveled as a traveling salesman to college libraries. So I've been everywhere. 
there's nothing that even comes no. close. Yeah. Well, David Borbo and I used to talk a lot about that, and we kind of put the seed back to Iron Warner. That, and uh, there's uh, sort of an old saying that if you've got an artist to settle into the valley, the 12 other artists that are going to uh, swarm in to help that one artist. Yeah. And here we had several artists, so the valley filled up with artists. And I think the same thing might be said about uh, writing and art artists. You know, Absolutely. When Baskin set up shop, Absolutely. look at all the people he attracted. Yep. Same thing. So, yeah, when you plant the seed, you have some ready soil here with people that like the country, but more you know, urban pleasures with country pleasures, yeah. both in the same place. Um, so I, I wrapped this all together. You had a lot of nice, eager young people mm -hmm. that wanted oh, to the move colleges, forward. Oh, the colleges. The colleges. Just wanted to move out. forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm a historian, and uh, this goes back to in the early American industry, Move on. If you were having wooden planes, crown molding planes for making crown molding, if there was a master in the valley, then there were six or seven other places that were making plain wooden planes. Yeah, they would apprentice and then they would go start their own shops, probably. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think another thing with the local committee that put now, even a church cookbook that some of them are so disgraceful and they don't need to be mm -hmm. and, and but I think that the local committee don't think they can afford a little better and, and they they don't know mm -hmm. you know uh, and it, it's a shame because they're not that many things the no, number one is good paper it's uh it's such a an important factor. The tactile feel of the book is, yeah. is really important. And, yeah. and uh, I can remember when Rich Handel uh, was designing the book and we would meet and um, I, uh, he had this page open and I said, you know Rich, you said, you haven't got that centered. He says, I don't want it centered. He said, and I'm the book designer, and he says, you're the writer. He said, I don't want that centered. What was his point? Why not? Uh, it's too common. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, this gives the book a little of its own, uh, just personality. like... Personality. Yeah, personality. Just like Bill Streeter got a broken tooth in front, mm -hmm. and Dennis said, don't ever get it fixed, because that's you. And, and, that, yeah. and I remember he opening up the book, and showing a page that's spread like this, and I said, my God, Rich, you're not going to waste all of that. Why <laughs> the margins <laughs> are huge. Well, all the note-taking that people are going to be doing, well, right? Well, uh, his answer was very short and very sharp. He said, white space is as important as black space in a book. Mm -hmm. It gives the eye a little rest. It's, it's not just all words crammed That's on right. That. Yeah. Uh, now, you take the book here, and um, which I I brag about a little because I was the architect of it, if you will. Hold, that, it, up, hold it up to your chest so we can get it into the film here. And, and um, you take that title page right there, and uh, I lost my train of thought for a minute. That there. you had designed that yourself. You weren't just letting him do all the work. Well. He was the book designer, and he insisted very, very much that uh, I wasn't to walk into the book design at all, that he, he was the book designer. And, uh, oh, I know what I was going to say about the book here. And the title of it is only one Cummington, and it's the history of the town of Cummington. And very fortunate for me, a, a historian, Cummington has a very unusually rich history for a town of only a thousand people. Uh, we started out a, a, uh, with the American Industrial Revolution and we had a very intellectual group in town with William Cullen Bryant, the poet. And between the industrial group and the intellectual group, I had plenty of stuff to write about. 
Well, what's the commune that was up there? I remember that kind of an That's artist. later on. This, that, yeah, that, that was still pretty important. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was. And we had a lot of schools for a small town. But the thing about it is, we wrote this book, and there was plenty of money behind it. I'll admit that, because the Warner Swayze Company, Mr. Warner, come out of Cummington. He was a multimillionaire. But after this book came out, it won a national award. The American Institute of Graphic Art picked it as one of the best 50 of the year, and it toured all over the world, literally all over the world, uh, at book shows to show what was winning in America. And this was one of them. And the publisher, or rather the printer, called me one day and he said, i got to have one of your books. He said, I don't know what it is about your book, but wherever we show it overseas, somebody ends up stealing it. And so we don't have it for the next show. They showed in Leipzig and all, all of the great uh, book centers of Europe. And Who knows it, how much influence it had? Uh, have you seen in or heard back from anyone who said, you know, we really like this design, we ran with it? I, I love the, the typeface. I love the, the, the colors. Uh, the book is used an awful lot at committee meetings. Uh, oh, you're going to write a town history? Well, you'd better look at only one coming to it. So, so you set the standard for uh, yeah, a town history. It sets the standard a lot, mm -hmm. and a lot of scholars have used it over at UMass. Uh, I get phone calls constantly wanting to follow up on mm -hmm. uh, what books was in uh, Dr. Peter Bryant's library when he died and that type of thing there. And this book doesn't show up until you get into the back of it with a 500 photograph of every house in town. and. It, Literally every house in town. Did you take photographs? All of us did. It was yeah, the, a volunteer the thing. I've seen a picture of the committee. Yeah, yeah the, the, that, that's one thing. A lot of old original document in the back of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the whole makeup of the book draws you into it. You, want to, you, you even remarked about that. When, when you open up the book and... Uh, I, uh, it's a pleasure looking at and touching. Yeah, uh, it's, it's already just, it does draw you in. Took me twelve years to do it. It's full of maps, and these maps were very difficult to make. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there were years. And the thing about <laughs> I'm so proud about it. it, it this map here is the map of Western Massachusetts when it was first laid out in the township. And to my knowledge. No other historian has ever put that map in. Even the county history haven't put that map in it. I found it in Boston in the archive down there, and that's the beginning of my story, is that map. That's another interesting angle to go off on, uh, Bill. You and archives. You are an archive speleologist, a speedlunker. <laughs> you love going in and digging and just finding things. I, mean, I remember you going to the Library of Congress and yep. coming back with stuff probably nobody had ever I, I've seen. I've been before. down there many times. Yeah. 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 You love archives. You love <laughs> I, I do. research. And yeah. I'm 84 now and pretty much confined to my chair here. I get out some. And my, the last book I did is the uh, big, th that one. No, yeah, that one. <laughs> no, the other one. I'm yeah, sorry. I don't <laughs> Right, no, the one you had your hand on. That too one. Too many books to be published. <laughs> I did three books on Cummington, and uh, the one we just showed you was uh, volume one, and I did a volume two, and I did it chronologically. Uh, that's one thing you have to decide when you're going to write a book is what format are you going to use. And once you pick the photo format for your book, you never... Get off from it. You, you, you stay on that format. More writers have failed because they got into writing their book and they didn't stick to their format or outline and they got all lost. They were way off over here in left field. And so now we was did... Was volume two a sequel or was it extra information? Was it stuff that you felt like you had left out of volume one? Uh, well, volume one format didn't call for any uh, anecdotal information or... It was all the facts. Uh, yeah. yeah, and this book followed the town meetings 
for 240 years, it followed the church meetings and the town meeting and the people's meetings. And uh, so, to, you, you said I'm an archivist, or I love to go into the archive. Uh, as I sit here, there's not a whole lot to do but to look at my own books. <laughs> I spend more time reading my own book and critiquing them, if you will. Well, Bill, I think we got a really good shoot last week, and we covered your books that you've written about Cummington, and you talked about the binding and the design. What we really want to see now is your handiwork. We want to see what you did yourself, your handiwork, the book bindings that you've done, and you've brought along about five or six books. They're beautiful just to look at from here without even opening them. Can we take uh, them one at a time and just you explore know, a little bit about them? You know, John, the one thing that they say is the shoemaker kids always go barefoot and the book finder never had any book for himself. So to <laughs> overcome that, I did this series of books for my wife as gifts nice. for a different birthday and so on. And, and I did it on books that she liked, which was Maxwell Parish. And this is the first one I'm going to show you here. And this is a box. I made them in boxes because I know that they break down over the year if you don't. So this is what we call a clamshell or a pullback box. And in it, I have a full leather binding I did. And the thing about the binding that makes it special for a gift for my wife is the leather onlay here. And that's a, an image within the book that I took within the book and had it, I, I, you can, we can find it if you want, blew it up uh, on a Xerox machine, laid it onto a very, very paper thin, absolutely paper thin piece of leather and put the wheat paint on and then pressed it into this leather which was also wet at the time. It's called a leather inlay. And if you do them nicely, you know, you feel that. You can't even feel it. It's it smooth with the book. No, you didn't have to cut into this leather binding to do no, that. No. That was that's thin enough. not inlaid. There is yeah. such things yeah. that inlaid. That, but, with that amount of detail, that would be, yeah. you'd have to be a brain surgeon to get and, that. And, but that's an onlay. Uh, another thing about the, this is a Maxwell Parrot uh, handmade end papers, pay, what we call paste papers, and I needed one that, that somehow or other went with Maxwell Parish. Uh, if you look at a Maxwell Parish uh, uh, illustration, you'll see some sort of deep color in it, very rich, deep purple color. Maxwell noted for that. And so I needed an end paper that would fit a Maxwell Parish. Uh, it's there. really beautiful. It's different than the usual marbled papers. Who did that for you, or did you do them? No, Mark Tomlinson over in, uh, which you may visit in your interviews. Uh, he's one of the leading bookbinder uh, in the area now, him and Daniel Calm and Peter Garrity. And uh, Mark spent two days in New York City at a reception for some boxes he made down there. So he is truly one of the leading bookbinders in the area. It's got a great texture yes, to touch, does. too. Uh, yeah, it's uh, paste papers do have because it actually is the texture of the flour that you make the paste out of to do the with. And How do they do this? I, I'm familiar with uh, marbling, with getting the, the swirls to go. And, and this is far, far removed from marbling. This is paste, not okay. marbling. Okay. And it, done with many different things. Uh, my wife Elaine uh, helped me with uh, covers of a poetry book for the Cummington Library, Bryant Library, and she took a, a drill that you drill a hole in the wall with and she rolled it back and forth. <laughs> and it was the most unique. This might have been done with a sponge, uh, it might have been done with many different things that he just picked up off his workbench and You're really it. free to uh, play totally, and do, totally. do things, see what, what you get out total, of it. Total freedom. Yeah, and, and it's not really expensive to do. So. Well, that's another thing about <clears> it. <throat> it's very inexpensive. So you can do. play around and kind see what you get. Kind of a poor man's uh, thing. And it's very, very different. But I, I wanted it desperately for this book. Sure. 
and, and not, you can kind of see figures in it if you it, stop oh, and look. Yeah, and it's, it's a cave. Uh, it's unlimited. Yeah, the, the paste paper is. Yeah. So I, I'm pretty proud of that. Now you got this to taper on the edges. How do you do that? What's what's the technique to get well, the edges it, to taper? At first I uh, scrobed a line on how deep I wanted it in onto the cover, and then a ruler with a knife, and I went off like this. Oh, you shaped and it. Cut it, shaped, and then I sanded it. Wow. So this is really an amazing piece of work, and well, you got the bands. Uh, yeah, these are for um, raised cords. They call it. Cords uh, are under here. Uh, let's see if I did sew it on cords. You can generally tell because you can get a little bit of a hump mm -hmm. where they're laced in, and I would say that I didn't lace them in. I would say that they're faults. You, you know can, what? You know what the cords do. They have <clears throat> they have another effect than just covering. You know the strings, the, the, these these raised bands, they fit the hands. Isn't you know, that nice? I always it's, thought it's that. It's like too. your fingers fit right yeah, in there. I always thought it's that. It's made too. for yeah. your hand, and look at how this stays open. I wish we could find that illustration of what I got on the front. You just flip through there and see it. You see him? He'll pop right out at you, and I think he still further down a little bit. Is that him? It I, is. Well, I see him, but he appears in different uh, drawings here. Let's see if we can find the exact drawing. Well, uh, I reversed him. I turned oh, him over. Oh, then it's probably this one here, if you reversed it. This? Is that him? Yeah. It's, kind of? It's, yeah, it's, there's, his, there's his cane. Okay. And, uh, and I reversed him because I wanted him walking onto the cover, not off of the cover. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely was a good yeah. choice. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, it's a nice technique. Now, you, uh, what did you do for the lettering? Did you Well, have I had a font. You had uh, a font, okay. Of uh, that uh, style, and so I used that font. Uh, and one of the things when you're critiquing a book like that by a hand book binder, it, did they have small square, that a sign of almost missed there, you see. That's a sign of elegance to have a small, instead of a clunky looking large square on the board. The square is the amount of board that portray over the text block. Okay. And so... It's just a beautiful uh, work of art. Tell me a little bit about the box. Now, well, you specifically the, made this box for the this box. Is, and it's it's inside you have a, another image of, uh, of the book. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's the cover. That's the that's original the cover. cover. Ah. Okay. And we do that to uh, show the world. Uh, there's the original spine down in there, mm -hmm. and uh, that so that the original artist gets their fair share. Is that typical to do when you make a box? Is no, to keep no. We're going to show. Well, we didn't bring it. Well, I got one where both sides were the original cover mm -hmm. down there. And you have velvet. Is yeah, a little one velvet. The, uh, you know, being a present for my wife and so on. I. And she's an elegant lady. I uh, mm -hmm. and it cushions it. From, yeah, it cushions it. Gets it knocked off the shelf in yeah, the middle of the night yeah. or something. And, uh, it fits so perfectly. Yeah. And, and then you added another. Yeah. Binding it, on it's top a quarter of that. Leather, three quarter leather because we got leather on the foredge over mm -hmm. here too. See, that's a leather strip down through there. And, it, it's um, just beautiful. I like the little heart. Is that from? That's just because it's my wife. That's her initials. That's sweet. Yeah. And uh, uh, David Borbo was one of my teachers. Uh, I had a lot of teachers, Daniel Kelm, David Borbo, so on. And David used to critique your boxer. He'd bring them over like this here, and they had to go down slow like oh, that. Oh, that they, is, they take fun. that is luscious, <laughs> the they, way that goes down. Yeah, if they didn't, uh, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> David would give me an A <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah, he would. Not just fit, but take time falling down. Yeah, yes, it's, yeah. That's, that's would, the ultimate touch. He, he would give me an A on that, uh, so that uh, uh, that's uh, very, very good. Uh, this how long, in, how far along in your career did you make that? How many years after you had started bookbinding did you do this? Because this is the work of a master. This uh, is not some guy who just started it out. I started training with Daniel Kelm and David Borbo, Don Glaister, all were my teachers in 1980, 
and I probably made this just about 10 years later in, in wow, 1990. Wow, you made some good progress. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, about 10 years. And even though we don't use the old traditional system of uh, apprentice, journeyman, and master, it automatically shows up. And I never call myself a master. I always consider that I reached the level of a journeyman. A master in anything, in particular bookbinding, because that's what we're talking about, can do anything, could even make his own tools to, to, to do it in bossing way. And I never reached that level. So I would consider that I did reach the level of a journeyman. I think that shows that. Uh, but uh, never. Well, when we were talking about Arno, Werner last week, um, he started at 10, 11, 12 years old working for pennies in, yeah. in a real old world yeah. setting. And that's so typical of the old world, whether, whatever craft it was. I, I saw a movie recently on tailors in Naples, Italy. And these kids would start at eight, nine, yeah. 10 years yeah. old sewing. And by the time they became the master, they knew they could do it all with their eyes closed. But See, the, now, the, the amount of work, I mean, they, they missed school, they missed everything. You know, nobody wants that anymore. Nobody wants that for their kids to just be uh, like, uh, piece work when they're uh, 10, you know. Could consider myself a master farmer off the farm. I was born and raised on yep. a New England farm, and we could shovel manure better than anybody else in the world, you know, uh, because we started when we were six years old. <laughs> you knew all the tricks of the trade. Yeah, I knew all the tricks of the trade. This piece of work, John, is a little different than that. This was going to be a gift to a couple that were going to take a cruise up the, I think, the Rhine River. If not the Rhine, one of the big rivers there in Europe. So I thought as a gift I'd make them a little blank book for taking notes on their trip. And this, uh, uh, I took the brochure, and this was uh, where they were going to stop Frankfurt, Würzburg, Rottenburg. These were all towns that I soldiered in, so I had a double interest mm -hmm. in that. And one of them passed away before they went, and they never went. So I kept the book. That's a beautiful keepsake. Um, let's hold this up for the camera so we can see. Um, and that's what you call blind tooling. I didn't use any gold. I stamped it with a hot gold stamping machine, but without gold. And I used the temperature had to be just hot enough to make it dark, and I used moisture in between the moisture and the hot tool uh, as blind tooling. And I thought it very appropriate for this color leather and, and this particular book. This has uh, a real kind of a Renaissance feel to it. It looks like something from the Italian Renaissance. It's got the color and the simplicity yeah. and it's, you know, it's uh, small, like a lot of the editions. And uh, a production shop in the Renaissance period would have pushed the book out like that. As a guide yeah, and things. They, yeah, they would have. The pocket book, the, the original pocket book. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That was made to put in their soup po coat pocket, and then I put a couple of pockets on the inside. That's a real nice touch. For, for uh, keepsakes like that. Sure. Now, the one thing when you're a bookbinder, you all are constantly doing is critiquing your own work. So if I was to critique the uh, as being my work, I would say these pockets should have a uh, accordion. Uh, accordion, so you could get more into it. Cram more in there, yeah. So that that would be one thing that I would critique. As a whole, I like it. Now that genuine marble paper, probably done by someone like Dan, uh, Dan uh, uh, De Sasso, and then there was a mm -hmm. good marbler over in East Hampton. I can't think of her name right now. She may have done that. And, uh, the paper is nice. What kind of paper is this? Um, Can you remember? Uh, no, it, but I think it's Italian. It's got a great texture. Yeah, you know. and deckled edges on yeah, the paper. You'd want to write with a fine yeah. fountain pen on this. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. So I use it as a uh, portfolio piece now. Yeah, I like how you've crimped the uh, yeah, yeah, edges that, of the spine. And, and um, during the WPA, during the Great Depression here in America, one of the things they did under the art program was bookbinding. And we went on a tour of the Boston Library, and the way the bookbinder sculpture 
their end cap on their full leather book. You can tell one craftsman from the next and mm -hmm. so on, and they would pick up a book and they'd look at, oh, this is so-and-so did yeah. this. Is that something that you would call original that you did, or you, you picked that up from somebody along the way? Because it's got a real nice personality to well, it. Well, we all do them just a little tiny bit different. Yeah. I learned it from Daniel Kelm and, and Don Glacier uh, and David Borbal, but mine would be different than yeah. any three of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be just a little bit different. It's really, really sweet. Yeah. That's really nice. So, that's that. Uh, this one here, I didn't actually uh, do anything with the book, I don't think. Uh, the book is just, it was my wife's book. It's the Arthur Rackham and one of her favorite books. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I made just the box and uh, I put an onlay on the front of it. Uh, you, you'll see the same image, I think, right here, one of the, mm -hmm. or on the inside. So I, that's an onlay again. You see, you can't feel it. it it's uh, right in there. And uh, it's a personal thing for my wife. And uh, again, if we could give it the test. Let's do the test. Let's do the <laughs> Let's test. test the, uh, I, I, now you've got me addicted I, I to doing this. I don't know. Uh, that, very, very it's nice. a little tiny big. I, I wouldn't get a, an A on that one. Let me ask you a question that only a non-binder would ask. How long does it take to build a box like this? How long we, does it take We're you? asked that question a lot and mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even have any clocks in my studio and it's a hard one to answer because I have a lot of gift of gab, I think they call it. And if you came into my studio, you and I would have to talk for an hour uh, before you, you left. Were, you were very easy to approach. You'd be right in the middle of a project and you wouldn't stop. Yes. So I would have to stop my project, yeah. uh, probably lay a wet cloth over yeah. it to keep the leather wet and so on. If I went right to work early in the morning, I would come out of this box at the end of the day. Wow. That I is would. amazing. If I didn't get interrupted and anything like that, even with the onlay and all, which is very tricky because you've got to get the image photo. I think there's this image on the inside somewhere too, so it's bigger. I could have taken it off the cover, but at any rate, you've got to give it the right size you want, and then you've got to pair the leather down absolutely how did you pare it down what were you using to we use what they call a uh, fortuna uh, machine uh, mm -hmm. or pairing machine that, this was probably a hand pairing machine it wasn't fortuna and, and you keep working a piece of leather through with a razor blade that adjusts the jet dry and then after all of that you would take a hand striving knife or paring knife and you would get it uh, you, this was so thin that you could hold it up to the light and see right through it. Hard to, was it hard to handle? And, to, I mean, terrific. this hand and the yeah. arm is so... Tri terrifically hard. Yeah. And very fortunate for me, being an old man, you see, I shook a little. And it's perfect. That's exactly the way, way it wanted to be, you know. Yeah. And, uh, now, I remember your shop very well. And I remember you having every toy, tool, and implement known to man. So when you talk about having a Fortuna, I mean, how many people have a Fortuna laying around? <laughs> uh, or a skiving knife or anything else. That, your shop was kind of famous for that. It was like a museum of, mm -hmm. of stuff around there. You had. Where did you find all of these things? Where did you find them? In, well, they're for sale. <clears throat> this is before the internet you found yeah. all this stuff. Uh, through wholesaler and yeah. so on now. Uh, buy, when you first go into book binding and say, oh my God, I never will get the tool. They're almost medieval tools. <laughs> I never will get them. But they come up. And the mm -hmm. uh, binder dies and his are up for sale or hers mm -hmm. are up for sale. And, and that another thing we should remark there is many female binders, handbook binders, is there is male. Uh, back at the turn of the 19th century, uh, they uh, had started some guilds, of, and the women were in the guild, and it immediately made it a 
progress or a uh, craft where there were many women as there meant before that the women were only allowed to sew the book mm -hmm. but after the guild started up the women became much of a part of book binding and the male binder I want to talk a little bit more about your shop and just how wonderful a place it was how magical it was that you could walk in, like you say, and talk to you pretty much any time. You would drop things. You had classes going on. You had binding. You lived there too, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, that's you time. Back. Yeah. I mean, it's like it was the perfect medieval, you know, uh, <laughs> Magus's uh, house. You know, was, with everything going on. Um, the, specifically, that building, I think, was perfectly adapted to what you wanted. It was right downtown. Yeah. Tons of windows, architecturally just absolutely beautiful. It yeah. it was it was unique. You you found the perfect place for your for your bike. And and the mayor of Northampton used to before he'd go to his office every morning, he said he'd walk by my shop and get inspired. Was that Musanti? No, that was Musanti. Musanti? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was a great mayor. Yeah, Tim and, and, he was always walking around. Yeah, yeah. and he said, I, I always walk by your shop because it inspired me for the rest of the day. It really was. Yeah. Now, the name Silver Maple, I remember how it got the name. Could you tell us a little bit how it, how it got the name? Before, what did you call it? Streeter's Book Bindery? The Heraldry Bindery. The Heraldry. Because I was a historian and it had to be connected <clears throat> with that kind of history. Uh, fortunately for the world, or unfortunately for the world, I was still in my radical years when uh, we had a silver maple across the street from our store, and uh, they decided to widen the road, and they was going to cut the maple down. And so a large movement took place in North Hampton to save the silver maple vine, the silver maple tree, and my wife and I were off to Europe on a vacation, and the night of the hearing was the night before we left. So at the hearing, I got up and gave an elegant speech about the reason we should save the silver maple, and so on. And by the time I got back a month later to North. Hampton, there were all kinds of little riots going on <laughs> to save the silver maple. I know people climbing, <laughs> living in the tree. Yeah, kind people of thing. And, and uh, even the Native Americans come down and did a uh, ceremonial yeah. uh, around the tree to save it. And uh, the uh, gay community got back of me on it. And yeah. they. Uh, had ladders stashed in back of my store to get up in the tree with and so on. And the day of Tiananmen Square in China, we woke up that morning and about four o'clock in the morning and there were tree company out there and they the fleet, snuck in and, and they it. snuck in and they cut that tree down. What a bunch of covers. And one of our gals a very brave young lady, I don't know her name right now, she sunk out and got one of the ladder and then she got on the back side of the tree where they didn't quite see her and she climbed up the very top of the tree. <laughs> they had to stop all progress, got the plea there and they got a cherry picker and they picked her out of the tree and took her to jail. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't remember exactly, yeah. but I'm sure you do. And you chose to name your bindery then yeah, after that. I see. So remember, it was a beautiful tree. It was huge. I remember mm -hmm. that. It provided yeah. shade to that whole street. Yeah. Um, they had a reason, a million reasons to cut it down and not one reason to save it. Yeah. And I they, remember. I remember they that. called, uh, uh, being a silver maple, they called it a weed tree because of the lifespan shorter on a silver maple, like only 80 years instead of 150 years. Yeah, so power, that was one of the big reasons. The power of words and language. Yeah. Yeah, to change the language and then do what you want. Something out of Orwell. I, I, I never see on TV, I see the, the uh, man in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square. Uh, that could have been you. <laughs>
<laughs> well, it could have been the young lady that tried that climbed the tree. Do you remember her name by any chance? We could look it up. God, we could look it yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> so that was good. That is great. Uh, That's a great story. One thing we did here in America, with, in the world of books, uh, that we would often have a master bookbinder come over from Europe and did workshops. And so they were doing a workshop in uh, Yale Saturday, and then we all moved up to North Bennett, North Boston on Sunday and finished the workshop. That was to give some, we did different things. And one thing that most of us, with this particular master, and I, I can't reach for name, but he was the head of the famous school in Switzerland. And some of the other binders will tell you his name because they trained under him. Mm -hmm. uh, God, it's up there, but I can't pull it off. We can, we can and do all this. So this book was completely falling apart, this little Bible. I mean, the leather protector, I mean, the metal protector around the edge of the square were uh, gone on, or it was falling off on it, and the covers were loose, and so on. So I took this book to take and restore it. So that a brand new piece of leather that comes in under the old cover like this, we lift it up and we put brand new leather in underneath like this and come around with the brand new leather and we sculpture our head caps up here like that. And then we sand down the old spine and we put it back on it. I'm particularly proud of this job because... Uh, it's seamless. I mean, you wouldn't yeah, know yeah. that you did those That's things. That's a good word. Uh, if you do it, and it cooperates with you and don't fight you and so on. You would on. never know that uh, you had to do you, all of those things. Yeah. Uh, I did one book for a book dealer up in uh, Vermont and he was at a book show the following day with it and uh, it was a very expensive book and somebody was taking it and said, I think I'm going to buy this book from John. And, uh, it's just I've been looking for it for a long time and the person he was showing said, you know it's been rebacked. That's what we call it when we put new material in. Oh God, no, it hasn't been rebacked. He said, oh yeah, it's been rebacked. Streeter did it down in Northampton. And it was like this book here. You actually had to almost take a magnifying glass and study it to see that it had been rebacked. If everything cooperates, you can get an amazing, uh, beautiful job on your rebacks. Peter Garrity, uh, uh, probably one of the best rebackers in the nation, and uh, no, you've you've really uh, saved this book and improved it. This is not a book that you would wanted would have wanted to leave in its original condition. I can picture something like, yeah. let's say, a Shakespeare folio or something like that. You'd want to leave in its original condition. You wouldn't want to rebind it because you'd want to see how it was made. Yeah. And, and get all the flavor of, of its actual making. This is a, I'm not going to say a cheap Bible. It's a, it's a useful, it's a commercial beautiful, binding it's a beautiful origin. Bible. It yeah. smells like a church. <laughs> oh my God, I, I feel holy again just holding this thing. So that, you did a beautiful job, and that is, uh, uh, now it's a useful book again for somebody to take to church. Yeah. And, and you made a box. You made a box for it, and uh, it's a, again, it's got the leather foredge on here. And I did this for my wife, and uh, it's, it's a, just a nice, simple, yeah, contrasting with the ornate binding yes, here. Yeah, so it's just a nice. It's like a surprise. You open this box and you go, yeah. "Wow!" And what's in you here? got your clasp on it like that. So I uh, had a reset area in here. For oh the my clasp. God. Bill. You see, so that uh, you are a maniac. It, look at that. It just fits perfectly. Let's yeah. just hold this up. Look at how we built yeah. the box to hold the clasp. Yeah. And, uh, and there it closes just. Oh my God. These are like jewel, jewel cases. <laughs> yeah. Fabergé bindings. These two here. Well, no, there's another, another reback in here. And. Uh, this book was all fallen apart in the new material and saved the old spine on it. And, uh, you know, you can hardly tell it. You have to really look to see the seam in there, you see. 
Or the old stuff. How did you manage? I can see how you do that with leather. How can you do that with cloth? Um, well, you can't sand cloth, but cloth is thin enough, particularly the early cloth like this, is thin enough so it will melt right into the other material. Is that using water or liquid? Well, or uh, there, uh, it's wheat paste, wheat paste. That is being used, so there is a, a degree of water there and so on. Yeah, because um, that is yeah. really melted into the other. Yeah, isn't it all? Unbelievable, yeah. Go now, uh, I, I think the one thing that perhaps it not realize, I don't imagine this has got a price in it, but uh, and these pages were all repaired. See here? They were all repaired too with Japanese tissue. The edges were all broken down and they're like that. But this book in this condition, I don't know, we'll just use a figure off the top of my head, it's probably a 250 or 300 dollar book. Uh, might even be more being Arthur Drachum and so on. But falling apart, you know, it brings the price way down. It's probably only a $75 book and not usable. But so by restoring it, uh, not only does it uh, make the book more valuable dollars and cents wise, and that's not why we're in the business, but it also <coughs> makes the book very usable and so on. It's just the usable it, it was before. Right? No, that's a, you've done a real good job of, of saving that book. I yeah. know that in my book business, which is essentially just a used book business, and uh, one of the ways that I can make money is finding books that are falling apart and perform first aid on them. Yes. Just get the spines back on them, uh, get the pages glued back in correctly, you know, do some minor repairs and take a book that might have gone on the junk pile and get twenty five, thirty dollars for yeah, it. I, so I, I know what you're talking about. Just just minimum help. Uh, this isn't uh, I beg your pardon, not an Arthur Rackham, this is Jesse Wilcox Smith. Yeah. And uh, this is the content. Oh here's the illustration here. Uh, yeah, I wanted to show the beautiful illustration. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, it's hard to find modern work like this. Uh, this is a period all to itself and must be saved. It can We can't allow the, our history like this to... Uh, I think books like this are getting more respect nowadays, too. Uh, you know, it used to be called children's literature, yeah. children's books. Yeah. They get a lot more respect now as, as works of art and uh, collectible and, and you've uh, all heard museum this, quality. Yeah, yeah, everybody's heard this style to, Title A Child Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson. Yeah, yeah. 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 You did a good that. job saving that. <laughs> Let's see. Here the comes test. the test again. A little fast. Oh, I'm glad we had the best one. We can go back and work on these, Bill. <laughs> I'm glad we had the best one for here. This I did this nothing. This is a fabulous book. Yeah, yeah this I did this. nothing. This is the Rackham. This yeah. is the Rackham, and I did nothing to this book. I just made a box to protect it. Yeah, it's uh, pretty nice on its own. Yeah. It's and a, it, it didn't have any problems. It's, no. It's uh, just this great is as it a is. a book that uh, anybody could be proud to own. And look how great shape it is. Let's see, what yeah. year was this? Probably was around 1905 or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, we'll look at it. It's probably back on this I one. I don't know. Uh, it's got a colophon in it. Showing a date, which drives book dealers crazy. But try the back side oh, of the title. Oh, is this numbered? Page. That's it's a limited a edition. Book, isn't it? No, we're not going to find out. Huh? Nineteen eleven. Nineteen eleven. Oh. And my wife loves Arthur Rackham. It's like it was uh, printed yesterday. It's yeah. Absolutely perfect. And, and that's why I wanted to make a box. Ah! Pretty near a winner. You there. don't have to work on that one. <laughs> no, I'm pretty near a winner. That one's done. On that that one. one's finished. May, may, maybe with the air gone out of it, it'll work. Well, I'm so that. happy, though, we got to see your actual handiwork. This is a, a real thrill uh, for me because I, I've been in your shop. I took a class from you. It's a very primitive, out of bind a cloth book. 
And I do remember you working on a lot of other people's books. And like you said, you didn't keep a lot. I'm glad to see the ones that you did keep. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. The, uh, now, when you're doing addition work, generally the rule that, that the binder get a copy of the addition you're doing, not always, but oftentimes. So they have uh, copies of, of books that uh, were, uh, were done. And Here's another dumb question to go along with how long it takes. How many books do you think you bound in your career? Oh my goodness. Oh, I have no in idea. The thousands, you say. Yeah, right? I thousands. have no idea. Yeah. Well, it's not, the number's not as big as you think it is, because it takes so long to do it. Did you do editions? Did you ever do like 50 copies of no, one book? No, I didn't do like any editions no. at all. No. And there's several different levels of book binding, and it's just like the, the Apprentice, the Journeyman, and the Master. And I see a niche when I trained that was needed, and that was a people's bindery. And I stayed within that niche all while I was the 25 year I did book binding. I stayed within my niche. And you had an open shop where people yeah. could just walk in and right. go, Here's a book. Can you fix this? Can yeah. you save it? How yeah. much is it going to cost? When yeah. can I get Back and, and, uh, and you would have an answer right then and there. It was it was really a retail operation. And yeah. very few binders want to do Bibles, particularly the big old mm -hmm. Victorian Bible sure. with the class metal class on it. But I don't want you to say, by golly, you, you want a cash flow, you got to do dissertations and you got to do Bible. And I desperately needed a cash flow because I was writing my books. Uh, that uh, before a photocopying book, I put $80,000 in that book. This is a perfect transition from your yeah. handiwork to your scholarship. Let's get that book, uh, bring it over here, and let's talk about that now. We, we, we um, needed to put uh, the money into it because it's such an esoteric type of book that you can't find a publisher for it right off the bat, so you've got to back it yourself. I do remember you doing this, Bill, and you were obsessed, and you discovered something that nobody, even to this day, can believe, that <laughs> these were early printing presses, these yeah. book presses, and the whole technique and everything. I think you did a great service to printing and history well, by writing that book. And that's, nobody would know. That's showing up now. It would have disappeared. In the sense that it's <clears throat> considered a scarce book. Yeah. Uh, and the price is going up on it. Not that I get any of the money, but uh, it's looked upon as being a reference book and a very important, as you just pointed out, a very important reference book. Very interesting book. Let's get it, and we'll wrap up our chat today by talking about that book. Okay. Well, well, we, we, well we had a lot of fun looking at your... Uh, handiwork. Now we want to see your scholarship. Well, this, the title of this book is Before Photocopying, The Art and History of Mechanical Copying, 1780 to 1938. So this cover a period of time from James Watt up to Chester Carlson, the inventor of the Xerox machine. And when James, the Xerox machine is from 1938. Yeah, from 1938. Oh my God. Who knew? Yeah. That's the seed, the beginning of yeah. it. It took a, a number of years to develop it, uh, yeah. 100%, but that the date we give it is the beginning. And you're everything in between. We're just about everything in between. In this book. Yeah. And uh, the idea of it is, it's to make single copies. It's not a duplicating process. It's a single copy, although you could make more than one copy, but generally it wasn't. And we, we today, we pretty much know the, the uh, bookbinders press, and I had some of them come into my shop and for Nipping presses. We used them to when we put a piece of paper down on a piece of cardboard for the end paper or the cover of the book. We didn't want any air in it, so we nip it into one of these presses like that. But they really wasn't bookbinders presses. They were 19th century copying machines. And I had one come into my shop and 
it had a set of ringers on it up at the top. There's a picture of them in in this book. It might even there it is right there. That's the one that came into the style that came into my shop is right there with the ringers and pan up there. And uh I found out through an encyclopedia that was a copying machine. So I went to Washington down to the Smithsonian and I asked them about it. Did they have any information? And after a, a, a conversation, the curator, she said to me, you know more about the machine already than any of us know down here. Why don't you write a book on it? And so that how it got started. And we wrote the book. And I had a co-author, Barbara Rhodes. And Barbara Rhodes is a... Uh, is, one of the book and paper conservator at the Museum of Natural History down in Washington, D.C. And uh, so she agreed to co-author. And she does the first part of the book and her part on the technical, chemical part of copying with the machine. Uh, the inks will go further in, further in yet. This is her part. Okay. It's like a textbook. And... Uh, she did that, and I did the industry that manufactured them. Now, the way that the process works is like this here. You take and you make your original copy. This is the original copy right here. And you use a special ink with a little gum arabic in it to give it substance. And you write your original with that. And I didn't hear like this here and using that ink. Then you put a piece of coarse Japanese tissue. I use the uh, onion skin here, but you use uh, Japanese tissue, and you, while this is still moist somewhat, and you lay this on top a bit like it here, and you put it in your copying press. This is your copying press right here. You put slide it in there for a minute, and the pressure of it with that ink, transfers it onto the back side of your tissue paper, and you read it like this here. And it uh, was used all over the world. It was uh, the way of copying for a hundred years. Uh, it finally carbon paper came and and took over from there. But well, this was used uh, from 1785, and I found. Uh, places like Smith and Weston in Springfield, Matt, using it in 1948. No, no, 1968. They were still using it for their export uh, arms. And so we wrote the book, Barbara uh, uh, Rhodes, uh, and I, uh, I did my part, she did her part, and uh, it's become very, it's got hundreds and literally hundreds of illustration in it and and again bill you didn't leave anything out i mean this is a beautiful book it's not just some uh 800 you know, trade u.s book. patents you, beautiful in paper beautiful printing beautiful yeah. binding everything is is very very nice you wouldn't have stinted on anything i know harvard keeps it on permanent display down there there because i use them for research a lot yeah, this is in the u.s patent office keeps it on uh permanent display down at the u.s patent office uh another thing that uh, silver maple was famous for was having these presses in the windows. You yeah. must have had 50 <laughs> or 60 yeah, filling your windows. There it is right there. Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> uh, the one thing about the book world uh, that if you want to write a book, your subject matter, there's not that many subject matters left. <laughs> there's been a book written on everything you can possibly think of. And for... Uh, a uh, journeyman bookbinder like me to find a subject that gone international was... Uh, What's fascinating to me is that this, as you said, was in use for over a hundred years. Yeah. It was in use internationally, and then it was lost completely to people's memories. It's the like minute carbon Xerox paper. and everything just got right, carbon paper. Yeah. All of those other technologies just wiped this it, out of the memory. Yeah. And, and nobody knew anything about it. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. uh, to show how prestigious they see it, the Smithsonian, the, the forward in the book. 
So, so uh, the introduction in the book is done by the Smithsonian. Yeah. So they took it real serious, uh, which was uh, was nice, uh, and uh, it's now out of print, of course. And uh, uh, believe it or not, I, I was in a very uh, unique situation. I was a bookman, uh, and I had knowledge of books. Uh, generally, a book wouldn't be quite as well done as the book. Wouldn't have a book designer that took so much pride in their work and so on. Uh, Maureen Scanlon designed it, uh, but being a bookman, my footprint in the sand, so to speak, is a book like this. You built this for the ages. You didn't yeah. build it for just yeah, today and goodbye. Yeah, yeah. this is this will be around forever. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a tech book now. It, it's sold in every country I can possibly think of, uh, even Z New Zealand and uh, down there. Where people now, do you think we'll ever see it make the next leap and become an e-book? Do you think we'll ever have somebody take this and scan it? And well, yeah, when you ask that question, you open up a whole can of worms because we don't, nobody really knows the answers of the question you just asked. This what? could be done. I mean, it is mainly black and white, no. so it's, it would stand up to scanning pretty well. Um, it is a very large format, and you wouldn't really want to read it on a tiny screen. Yeah. But you could do a really high definition uh, scan of these. And, and have this online and if you wanted to read it on a reader or if you wanted to read it on your screen or however you wanted to read it, yeah. you could do a very high quality <coughs> scan of this. Now the U.S. patents, <clears throat> they come in many different forms and sometimes in order to get them, they've been reproduced three and four times before you get it. And we call it the three or four generations. Mm -hmm. And they're awfully hard to redo, so I had to pay particularly attention to get the best possible reproduction. I, I could look around and help you maybe get this online as an ebook and reach <laughs> even more people. <laughs> uh, well, but that's for our next conversation. Yeah, and uh, I used to think that way, but at 84 now, I have to admit, I enjoy my easy chair, and I take my books and I read them. I love them. <laughs>